Good morning and welcome to the second Social Inclusion Forum of 2018. The theme of this particular forum is of course community. My name is Denver DeCruz and as General Manager of Inclusion Solutions, I'm both honoured and privileged to be your MC for this incredibly important forum. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the local Wajak people. As an organisation, we wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and pay tribute to their elders past, present and future. Some brief housekeeping rules. Um, I'd like to ask you firstly to turn off your mobile phones or put them onto silent if you don't mind. The bathrooms are, are located outside on the right hand side in the corridor. In the event of an emergency, please exit the building, cross over the car park and meet over at the assembly point next to Lake Munger. I take this opportunity to acknowledge a few special guests in, the pres in, in our presence today. Firstly, from National Disability Services, we have Jane Cousins and Kelly Cade. Inclusion Solutions wishes to acknowledge the ongoing support of NDS in bringing you this forum today. Also acknowledge Ms Janine Freem Freeman, MLA member for Mirabuka. Representing Mr. Michael, uh, sorry, Minister Michael Murray, we have in the room Matthew Kavanagh and Emma Ramage. Finally, representing Simone McGurk's office, Mr. Joshua Cuniff. On behalf of Inclusion Solutions, we thank you all for your attendance and continued support. The famous author, Margaret Wheatley, stated, one of the things that we need to learn is that every great change starts from very small conversations held, among, held amongst people who care. Today, we have nearly 100 people in the room and we've all come together because we clearly care. We care about the communities we live in, we care, care about the communities we work in, and collectively, we have an immense ability to have conversations with one another today that can benefit and shape WA communities into the future. Today, I encourage you to engage in conversations, to get to know people. And over the next two hours, we have an excellent lineup of pres presenters today. So as an overview, first up, our senior inclusion consultant, Kira Cooney, will set the scene for our four wonderful presenters. Following Kira, we'll have a presentation from two guest speakers. The founder of not-for-profit organisation Fair Game, John Van Broxmere, and Access and Inclusion Officer at the City of Joondalup, Erica Everett. These presentations will be followed by a networking opportunity at the morning tea break. I'm told we have some delicious food and, and teas and coffees will be served as well. Following the break, we have a, a, a presentation from Individualised Services Manager at Inclusion WA, Christy McNamara. The final presenter will, it will be James West from PCYC. Lots to look forward to today. We encourage you to take lots of photos and please you tag us in your social media. You can find us at Inclusion Solutions WA on Facebook and please use the, hash, the hashtag Social Inclusion Matters if you can. Emma, our photographer, will be taking so, um, photos with the sign Social Inclusion Matters and she'll be found at the back during the break as well. Just letting you know that Bernie, our videographer, will also be videoing today's conference um, and, and that'll be made available as a resource moving forward as well. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Kira Cooney. Kira joined Inclusion Solutions in 2014. Originating from Drada, Ireland, say that right, Kira? No. <laughs> I'll try again next for him. <laughs> Kira moved to Perth in 2012. Kira completed her university education in community development and has spent the past decade in various community development roles in Ireland, Africa, the United States and Australia. Through her travels, Kira has witnessed the power of sport and recreation and its ability to bring communities together. Kira has used her experiences and knowledge to work with various communities throughout WA. Communities such as Tom Price, Parabadoo and Bayswater, just to name a few. Kira is personally extremely passionate about sport and recreation and in her spare time, Kira enjoys camping, paddleboarding, dancing, Gaelic football, yoga, and exploring regional WA. Please join me in welcoming Kira Cooney. I might get rid of this. Good morning. As Denver said, my name is Kira. Um, and to give you a bit of background about inclusion WA today, 
Um, we are a non-for-profit organisation and we were founded in July last year, so this is our one year birthday and we're very excited about that. Um, we have a sister organisation called Inclusion WA and they have a proud 30 year history in the community working alongside people living with a disability, helping those individuals get connected to the mainstream community. Inclusion Solutions, our main focus is social inclusion for everyone, so all people have the ability to be truly involved and connected to their community. We use an asset-based community development approach. So we use the assets within the community and we never want to work in a community for a long period of time. To give you a bit of background about our organisation, we work with 30 different local governments a year. We work with 30 different state sporting associations. Between 500 clubs, sporting clubs, community groups and businesses a year, helping them to be more inclusive helping them to open their doors and be more welcome to everyone in the community. We also work with 20 schools throughout the year, this year alone actually, um, supporting them to be more inclusive. So we believe that inclusion starts at the school gates. Today I'm going to give you some frameworks that you can take away and utilise in your work, in your home life, in your community life. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. Why are some people not included in our community? I want you to turn to the person next to you, in front of you, behind you, and just in 30 seconds, share why you think people are not included. Go ahead. So bringing it back in, so I'm going to pick on a couple of people now and I'm looking at Cameron, I've just seen your face <laughs> and I can't forget your name. So Cameron, would you be able to share the conversation you had with Kelly, just a couple of um, points, why people you think have not been included in the community? I have an unconscious bias towards the, the background of that people that they're looking at holes, so yep. be the colour of their skin, uh, their ethnicity, uh, their age or whatever element. Perfect. The majority of clubs, groups and businesses that we speak to, they say it's too hard. We don't know how to include people. So we're afraid to even start this process. The fear of the unknown. And these are the main barriers why a lot of people in our community don't include people. So I think it's really important that we just get that out in the open and talk about how we want to overcome these. So up here you'll see Mr. John O'Brien behind me. John is an advocate for people living with disability, but not just people with disability. We can put his hundreds of reports to anyone who's marginalised in the community, any individuals that have not been included. So John states that these are the critical elements of being truly included. So sharing an ordinary place, choice and control, contributing, being someone and belonging. Now let me share a story with you. There's a great club in Subiaco called Earthwise. Earthwise did this so holistically and so naturally. They are a great community garden. They did this so natural, a gentleman called Vince. Vince is in his 50s, really, really positive gentleman and really um, interested in gardening, really wants to be part of a community. Um, Vince's life looked really different. He was quite um, isolated prior to being part of Earthwise. Um, he went to a segregated workplace, a sheltered workshop, he went to a disability specific art group. He was never truly part of the real community. Earthwise naturally just wanted to have new members, wanted to have more members and be a true reflection of the community. They did this so naturally. Vince shared the ordinary place. And this is the first step to inclusion. You cannot be included unless you share an ordinary place. Vince had choice and control. He attends every single community garden day and he does not miss a social gathering. And boy, his life looks very different now. He is fully active in the community. He is completely valued in his club because he has great knowledge on the community sector, on the community gardens. He's at every different social event that's happening. He has a lot to give. He has many valued roles. Vince has a disability, but people don't see that disability. People see Vince as an individual who just has a lot to give has lots of knowledge on the community. And that's what all community groups, 
businesses, that's what we all want to focus on, right? We want, we want to just all people to have the ability to be truly involved and have a sense of belonging. So I encourage you, with these dimensions here, to utilise them in your work life and in your community life. Ask yourself the first question. Wherever you work, can someone share that ordinary place? I want you to ask yourself, if a person in a wheelchair rocks up to your workplace or your community group, can they get in? Can they get into the building? Because that is the first step. And then on the other side, let's take the other spectrum. If someone is quite nervous or anxious and they rock up to your workplace, your sporting group, are they welcomed by someone with a smile? It's a, a massive thing. So if you're welcomed and you feel like you truly have that sense of belonging and you're respected, it does a lot. So up here we have the pyramid. So on the bottom, physical access, functional next, and then social. So there's lots of legislation to showcase that people shouldn't be discriminated. That people should have the opportunity to be truly part of our community. Lots of laws to show that, that's great. But as an organisation, we like to focus on social inclusion. Meaningful change happens with social inclusion. If people feel like they truly belong and they have that sense of being valued, they stay at a community group, they stay more active in our community and that's where the power of change happens. Today, the people in this room have the ability to make change in individuals' lives people who may be marginalised, people who may be isolated. We have the ability to make small changes to improve an individual's life and the community. So up here, there's a gentleman called Michael Kendrick. Michael Kendrick is an understudy of Mr. Wolf Wolfensberger. Cool name. <laughs> and it's not made up. Michael says that people should begin to occupy socially valued roles in their community. And if we focus on this, this is where the change happens. There's a young lady called Jade. Jade is 22. And Jade is part of Knit Natters. Now, she's not much of a natter herself. She doesn't really like to chat. But she's an amazing knitter. And she's part of a community group. And she knits beanies for hospitals for premature babies across Western Australia, not just Perth. She has a valued role. Jade does have a disability. And the reason I take, it, take Jade is because she doesn't really like to have a chat, but she does so much for her community. She knits the most amount of beanies. She is truly valued. She teaches the group how to do really intrinsic, different types of styles of knitting. She is valued in her community group. They meet once a fortnight. Her life looks totally different. The community group's life looks different because these barriers have been broken down. She shares the ordinary place, she participates, but she truly feels like she has a sense of belonging. And we all know there's lots of reports out there to showcase if you live, if you have um, a sense of belonging in, your, in belonging in your community, you live a longer life. Well, I truly believe that. When you feel like you belong, your life looks totally different. So is it really inclusion? Again, I'm going to, to turn around to someone in front, behind, or beside you. And I want you to ask yourself, what does a totally inclusive community look like to you? I'm gonna give you one minute. I want you to speak to someone that maybe you don't know, in front of you, behind you, next to you. What does a totally inclusive community look like to you? One minute. So would anyone like to stand up and share what a totally inclusive community looks like to you? And if you don't stand up, I'll just pick you. I know everyone's name off by heart. <laughs> anyone at all? Grace. <laughs> Got a microphone. So Grace Mills here. <laughs> I should have known that was going to happen. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, the three of us here, we were discussing how uh, people will feel completely comfortable in their surroundings. They feel they can ask for assistance if, they have, if it's ever required. Uh, you also said something about how 
um, people are often... Oh, what was it? There was something about... We had like five separate points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what were you saying? Um, that, you know, working in community development, we often develop programs and we think about things like physical access, but we don't look at it totally holistically of, you know, there's a lot more to inclusion than, than saying, you know, people can come and making physical access. It's about building the community around that, I suppose. Great. Yeah. Would anyone else like to share? Um, so I'm Rebecca from HCA Home. Um, we were talking about how it's almost not even needing to ask. It's kind of just the given. And I think a really important part of that is making sure that there are people who have, who have been excluded, put in roles where they can control the situation and make things that you shouldn't even need to ask for, like accessibility. Um, Janine was talking about, say, women breastfeeding. It shouldn't have to be something you need to ask about. It should, should be a given. And it's really important to have those lived experiences from people in the higher roles in the community so that inclusion can be a reality for everybody. Great, thank you. Exactly as you said, inclusion means all. Yeah, would anyone else like to share? Good, sure thing. So just as I said, inclusion means all and it's not about just segregated groups. It's about all individuals having the opportunity to live a fulfilling life. So let me go back one. So up here we have exclusion, segregation and integration. Exclusion, not having the opportunity to fully belong. So I shared this the last time. Um, I am clearly from Ireland with this accent. So I came over here six and a half years ago. I wanted to get involved in a sports club, um, playing with other females. I gave um, the club a call, a particular club, and I said, I'd really like to get involved. And the lady said, we don't accept foreigners. So straight away I was excluded. Now this happens every day. This happens and this is a true story. So it's really important to think that the people here today can make those changes. Segregation. We have the second slide here. So the big circle is the mainstream community, the real world, and segregation is the smaller world. There was a great nightclub in Fremantle and it was on on a Monday was in the Norfolk Hotel. This was only for people with disability. You had to prove that you had a disability. There was no alcohol served at the venue. No choice, no control, no sharing an ordinary place. Only connecting with other people who have a similar, who are similar to you, may have a disability. That's not inclusion, that's participation. And participation is different to inclusion. And there is absolute merit to participation. But today we are talking about inclusion and how we, as people in the community, can make a positive change for people to be truly included. And for us to step back from doing work for and to, but more to do work with, with community, empowering people to occupy those valued roles. And then integration. A closer step to inclusion. Really great. People have the, may wear the same uniforms, may train on the same nights, are truly part of the community, and it's a pathway, and it's based on skill and ability. Perfect, perfect step towards inclusion. So I'm going to stop, stop harping on now, because I could talk all morning. Um, today, I really encourage you to keep your mind thinking about the power of, in of inclusion. And as we listen to these great guest speakers, think about what small change that you can make in your community to positively impact individuals. And think about what you can do moving forward. I encourage you to listen to the guest speakers and ask plenty of questions at the end. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Kira. I think the one thing that really resonates with me there is that it's not just powerful for the individuals involved who may not have had opportunities in the past, but it's also the impact that they have on the communities around them. Um, at my local career club, uh, we've got several members with disability, we've got several members from other devalued backgrounds, and the, the amount that they put back into community, and, and you know, they're the cornerstones of our career club. Um, really, really powerful there, the stories of, uh, of Vince and Jade as well. 
The first of our guest presenters is John Van Broxmere. John is a, a, a young health leader dedicated to reducing health inequality in WA. John's work positively impacts thousands of people each year. John is an, a remote emergency department doctor leading significant change within his role in the public health system. John volunteers for a number, a number of local, national and international initiatives in the fields of medicine and community development. In 2015, John was named in the top 10 outstanding young persons in the world. Special guest. John has pursued a career as a medical generalist, gathering a broad experience base from a variety of settings. He completed a master's in tropical medicine and public health with vocational placements in disaster management in Washington DC and emergency medicine in East Timor. He has completed research in paediatric toxicology and is currently investigating management targets within rural septic patients. Working as an intern, John was shocked at the health disadvantage of Australia's remote population. He established an innovative solution to the problems of lifestyle-related illness through his, his charity, Fair Game. The volunteer group helps mentor and fosters and uh, sorry, helps mentor and foster positive change in remote communities through the donation of recycled sports equipment and the provision of health education. The group impacts the local community well beyond donating 25,000 of pre-loved sports equipment. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming John Van Broxme. Here we go. So thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name's John and I'm going to be talking a little bit about Fair Game, a little bit about myself and um, my opinions on inclusion. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and also I'd like to acknowledge the um, Nyungamata and Garimata language groups from the area of Port Hedland, uh, which is where I live at the moment. And I'd also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal people who are here in the room today um, and welcome everyone else to the presentation. Um, so today, um, what am I going to do? I'm going to offer you some personal um, insights and reflections into my life and some of my thoughts about my, my work. Um, I'd like to possibly reflect on my definition of inclusion as a health practitioner. I know we might have um, people in the health service industry and people who are also health practitioners here today. I'd like to take the opportunity to outline Fair Game, our organisation, what we do, um, our, our mission, our vision and our achievements um, but I'd also like to take the moment to reflect on the process of inclusion and, and my personal reflections on our organisation and also on our growth. I think it's really important to, to acknowledge where we've come from um, and think about that full dimension of inclusion. I'd also like to discuss how sport can actually be related to social inclusion. Um, whilst some people may think you know, the abilities based nature of sport and fitness can actually exclude people. I'd like to use Fair Game as a model of, of a way in which we can think about different ways of including people through sport and fitness. And because of the, the theme of today's event, I'd also like to discuss community partnerships and how we've used them and leveraged them because I think that's why we're all here today. So when I go through this, um, hand up if anyone is working in health or has worked in, in the healthcare field here at the moment. So pretty good range of people. Um, and inclusion for me as a doctor on my, in my everyday work really is about making sure that pa patients have a voice, um, that the patient inclusion, the patient perspective is included in their health decisions. And in Port Hedland, it's something we're really trying to work hard on. And we have meetings every week with cases, we have liaison throughout the emergency department. And then when I was reflecting on what inclusion actually means for me, I came up with this statement, and for everyone it's different, but this is what I'd like to structure my talk around and mention how Fair Games tried to you know, pursue this throughout our organisation. So it's an environment that allows any individual to bring their whole self into the conversation, achieving uninhibited equal contribution from all members of society. And that's something that I sort of have been reflecting on over the past few years and certainly reflect on through my work. So let's start the story. Um, I grew up here in Western Australia. I went to school in Mount Lawley. Um, and when I was five years old, I had a rock museum and I invited all my friends around to come and look at my rock museum. And they came around and they looked at these brown rocks and they said, wow, and from that day forwards, I knew that I liked giving to the community and being involved in other people's lives. 
Um, it was just something that, yeah, I don't have a rock museum now, you'd be pleased to know, but I live in a place where there are a lot of rocks, so I suppose it's fitting. Um, and after this, I went through school, went through uni, did a couple of different things overseas, and then I thought I, I wanted to challenge myself with my intern placement. So I chose Charles Gardner Hospital, and then um, that rotates to Port Hedland, and this is the old hospital in Port Hedland. And when I was in Port Hedland Hospital, um, I had what I call my tin can moment. And it was despite travelling around the world, you know, volunteering in Africa and other, other places, it wasn't until I was in Hedland with a man who was 18 years of age and he had obesity hyperventilation syndrome, which is where someone has, you know, so much extra weight on that they can't stay awake because the oxygen levels and the carbon dioxide levels in their blood are making that person fall asleep. Um, and we are putting what's called a CPAP mask, which is a mask that helps blow air into someone's lungs to, to put oxygen levels up in their brain um, onto this man. And before I was getting the mask ready and sealing it on his face, I looked out the window or the ambulance door of the hospital and I saw some kids. So this man was 18. These kids were probably eight and they were kicking rubbish, kicking a tin can, rubbish around the forecourt of the hospital. And I just sort of thought what has happened in those 10 years in terms of the lifestyle decisions that this patient has made that have led him to be from A to B. And I thought that's a real shame. And it struck me that that's where the health inequality in, in this state lies. It's the ability for people to independently make healthy lifestyle decisions. And I thought, I was very aspirational. Uh, I thought, let's change this. Um, so I phoned four friends and we started collecting recycled sports equipment to drive essentially from Albany to Kununurra, stopping at communities in which we'd worked with or which we had liaison with along the way. And the model, the idea was that we could donate recycled sports equipment that would give people the tool to be able to make those healthy lifestyle choices. And that was where the, the concept of Fair Game, which is our organisation's name, came, came apart. Um, and over the time, we realised we were kind of onto something because everyone had worthless items or sports equipment in their garage. I'm sure we, some of us probably here do. And those items, you know, not only are they, you know, a use of carbon and, and energy, but they're collecting dust and they're not being used. And how could we actually change that? So the donations kept rolling in. And so we moved, and, and my reflection of this is we actually moved into that kind of physical inclusion space. So at that point, we started using volunteers who are you know, doctors, nurses, teachers, generally involved people in the community um, who wanted to help. And we were physically in, other, in, in strange situations in communities, um, in service agencies, and we were starting to put different people together. And then we started to think, well, how could we actually try to make this vision? We had a clear vision and a clear mission, but we, we didn't necessarily have that structure yet. And so we started using our existing skills as health practitioners to implement and integrate messages of health into the recycling of sports equipment. So what we were doing is we'd find that we'd donate football boots and we'd run a football game, but then after the football game, you know, everyone was tired and what could we do? Well, that might be a great opportunity for us to use our skills for you know, dental hygiene, hand hygiene, talking about what food resources are available and how we can eat a little bit healthier so that we can impart everyday access to those healthy lifestyle choices. And so I think we probably started moving at this stage away from just physically being in the area to starting to think about a bit of functional inclusion. You know, we would donate equipment that would allow people to participate in community um, and then we would donate healthy community packs. So we currently, for every participant, um, gets a, a water bottle, um, a set of hygiene equipment that stays in the, in the classroom so that they'll be able to continue making those lifestyle choices. And then as time went on, we realised that we, were, we really needed to offer more opportunities for the participants to engage with programs that might be more meaningful and might be more accessible for them. So Fair Game moved away from doing things such as competitive sport to doing sports-based games where everyone can be a team leader, where everyone in, who's in that community can participate, where it's not necessarily score and goal-based, it's enjoyment and outcome-based. And so we started training young people and you can see in this photo, there's a couple of our volunteers in a remote area. And we started running what's called the Fair Gamers Training Program through our academy. And every year, or twice a year actually, this year we've got a training application open at the moment, for anyone who's interested. We run a day of training and we train in our three or four core programs that allow young people to connect with each other and then to go and connect with the community and volunteer in a really meaningful way across our state to help 
our vision, which is for a fit and healthy Australia. So in terms of our achievements, I just want to put a couple of numbers up here um, and I'll, I'll talk to them and then I'll go through a bit of a reflection about some of our community partnerships and how we've developed that and how we're moving into the social inclusion space. So the first one is 30,000, which is the, uh, the number of equipment items we've donated so far. Um, and if you think about the cubic metres, that's a whole lot of stuff that hasn't gone to landfill. It's a whole lot of things that have gone to community and allowed people to participate in sport and fitness. And I think that's really the sustainable element of Fair Game. 3,000, so that's the number of participants we have per year across Western Australia, across all ages, all abilities, all locations. We currently have volunteer coordinators in the Pilbara, the Kimberley here in Perth as well. 200, this is a really special number for me. So this is the number of fair gamers in our organisation. We have a very positive organisation culture with strong values um, and every one of these people are important to myself and I think it's important to also recognise the diversity within this group and the inclusion of other people, which I'll talk about later. And then four, this is the future for fair games. So in the last um, sort of nine months, we've trained for Aboriginal people who have come on board in terms of our actual organisation itself. So whilst we mentor participants um, in remote areas, uh, we're seeing an increase in the diversity and the inclusion of other people within our organisation. So that's our sort of you know, first step in this last year of people who've just discovered Fair Game and want to get involved. So reflecting on opportunity and positive partnerships, I'll go through some of our programs now and the structure in which I think they've been able to add value. So the first one of which, and how we've partnered with other organisations. So the first one is our Recycle and Donate program. This is where we donate those 30,000 items. We have allowed anyone to access it via online request form. Uh, we work with communities. So what we do is every 12 weeks, we uh, email out, and you're welcome to be on the email list. If you have a sports club, say, look, hey, we've, we get donations from people in, in Perth or around the state. What do you need? What can we um, donate to you? So it might be um, in Wyndham, the Wyndham um, there was a netball team that wanted shoes because they couldn't participate in a competition. So we donated a whole team of shoes who actually were allowed and able to participate in sport because of that. We have a blue bin um, collection system. So down the bottom you can see we work strongly with UWA and a number of other uh, local governments including City of Subiaco. And we have these bright blue bins that people can go and donate their equipment to. But then where does that equipment go? Well, as you can see from this Instagram post, you know, we get the wish list items in and this is how we're really able to positively partner, partner with communities and make change. The second one I'm going to talk about in a moment is our wellness walkabout. And I think this is really growth from our organisation and an understanding about the concept of you know, diversity, inclusion and involving our participants as equals with our organisation. So I'll talk about that in a moment. But just before then, I'd like to talk about our um, Aboriginal corporation partnerships. So we do work with a range of corporations across Western Australia, including IBN in Headland. Um, we work with Edmund Rice here um, in Perth, and we also work with Gandua up in the Kimberley. And what we do is we partner with them to find out and to ask them when, when and how can we help, rather than saying we'd like to come and do this. You know, so we know that in, in the Kimberley, we help in the October school holiday period when um, some of the Gandawa support workers might be um, you're having some days off after the big carnival and that's when Fair Game can really plug those gaps and help our mission and, and grow our community support. <coughs> in terms of IBN, we have something called the Wellness Walkabout and this is an A3 fla framed flipbook. It's Australia's uh, only Aboriginal language yoga program and it's an amazing, amazing program that allows people to discover new abilities about themselves and it also allows people to not only learn language and it might be for us learning other languages but engage in uh, sport or a slightly different sport of sport and recreation. So. This is translated into three highly enda um, endangered languages, as they're, as they're called. One of them only has 30 native speakers. So it's about a, a girl or a boy who goes walkabout um, and sees a Dreamtime uh, animals. And the stories are written in partnership with communities. So we go to a, one or two of our favourite communities and we say, what, what animals do you like, kids? And you always get zombies, giraffes, um, <laughs> elephants. So you kind of have to rein it in a little bit um, and at least produce some animals that will have a local language. So we, we try and, and get get those and then we go and ask some yoga instructors to design some poses and some sequences that are culturally appropriate. So, you know, a lot of downward facing dogs and things may not necessarily be appropriate in communities. So, you know, where are the seated positions that we can use? And then um, we put it all together in a storybook. So it's sitting out the front and you turn the pages and then there'll be the 
um, the local word for, say, kangaroo, and then the instructor, who might be a fair gamer or might be a participant, comes and reads the story on the back and everyone does the pose and then you, the story goes on and you change over. But I think this is a great opportunity to highlight the community partnership for this program. I did some academic research on it when I was living in Derby and I did it every day, every um, week with a, with a class of year three, fours, um, and we showed some scientifically relevant improvement in conduct and mood disorders for some of these children. So the teachers would use this program to get control um, and to help the class calm down because there's a lot of stressors and, and traumas in some of these areas. So in terms of the topic today, which is about um, you know, sport, community partnerships, I, I feel like this has been a program that we've matured in as an organisation and we've really moved forwards um, towards that it, you know, the idea of including our participants in the program so that we can then go and give back. And most recently last week up in the Fitzroy Valley, the team have come back with another story um, that they were you know, discussing at night with the kids who brought a, you know, a, a Dreamtime story about it and we're looking at how we can integrate some of these stories. Of, it's, a, it's about the solar system and stars and I'm trying to think about yoga poses that would mirror them. But what this space that might be our next one so the next thing i wanted to talk about was our growth um as an organisation, we just started as a group of friends. Obviously, you, when I phoned up four friends, these were people that I knew who perhaps shared the same values as me. Um, and I wanted to talk about with those 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 dimensions of inclusion, just give you some examples of people who are part of our team and how we've been able to and how we really value people's input regardless of, of their social and personal circumstances. So the first uh, man you'll see here is Riley. So Riley's family come from um, the central Arnhem land and Riley was an, an, has just finished his university degree. In terms of that concept of choice and control about your know, life experiences, opportunities, and contributing with dignity, et cetera, um, and the ability to take those risky opportunities, Riley has decided to come on as one of our board members, um, obviously a, you know, a very youthful um, man, and we've helped support him through um, AICD training, et cetera. But the idea that he's been able to choose how he wants to contribute to Fair Game, and we've been really open to having someone you know, a little, with a little different perspective come on board our board that can really help us um, not only you know, give him the choice of what he wants to do, but also help us as an organisation. The second um, group of people, so Nat and Rick and Finn, who's one of their two sons, um, I'd like to talk about contributions and how um, over time through Fair Game we have a bit of a pipeline of volunteer experiences because we want everyone to be able to contribute. We have junior Fair Gamers and we've um, there's one particular um, young man who joined us at age 16 or 15 and he's been contributing now and he's 21. So he's moved through a junior fair gamer to be a fair gamer, to be a senior fair gamer, trip leader, and now he's looking at becoming a patron for our training program. But Nat and Rick uh, have gone through their journey with Fair Game and they've now um, started a young family. So they've got two children and whilst working and Rick's a peer teacher and Nat works for Treasury, we how can we include them in our volunteering experience? So we try to make sure that there are opportunities, be it coming down on a Sunday morning to recycle equipment, be it you know, Tuesday night or Tuesday afternoon activities in the city or Saturdays in the wheat belt or full week long trips that would allow other people at different stages of life to participate. And we're looking at um, establishing a Friends of Fair Game where we can have general community supporters who might not want to do our training but actually would love to come down on Sunday and help us clean boots and, and box them up to be able to contribute as well. And the last one is belonging, and I'd like to talk about Luke, who's uh, this man here. So Luke has an interesting background. Luke um, has lived through Singapore and um, Indonesia and has come back to Australia after military service from Singapore and wanted to contribute during his university um, degree, obviously not, not being a, a local person. Um, Luke certainly found a sense of, of belonging within a fair, within a fair game. Um, people value everyone's opportunities, but Luke has really brought something unique to our team and everyone sits down and listens to him. And last week he was on a great trip in the Kimberley. And for me, it just, it just showed how um, we are able to, through training and having an open mind and through sport and fitness and these programs we're doing, really integrate other people into our conversation. So reflecting now, I've um, just got a couple of minutes left, on that inclusion pyramid, I'd just like to think and reflect on how we've been able to, I think as an organisation through sport, fitness and community relations grow from not just being physically in the same area. So we started by taking you know, volunteers and going into, into communities you know, using wish lists to actually offering functional inclusion. So 
reducing the barrier to participation by not just doing competitive sport, for which there are other agencies that service it. All of our team-based games allow everyone to be captain, allow everyone to um, you know, participate. There's no not there's high fives, not hugs. There's not necessarily a score at the end of the game. Um, towards that social element of inclusion, which I think is where Fair Games' vision of being community-led um, is really important. So that's about our internal growth, not only our diversity, but our inclusion of other people and our vision um, to have hubs in the regions that recycle sport equipment and really adapt to local, to local need. So to conclude, our vision, if you would like to, you know, as a case study for what we're talking about today, is a fit and healthy Australia for, for all. Um, I think sport can perhaps be an under-recognised vehicle for inclusion if done in the right way. Um, we try to you know, partner with organisations at, at all stages across our journey and we've definitely got room to, to grow in this space. You know, I think a recognition internally that you know, we can be more inclusive in other ways and there's a couple of big ways that we can do that. But uh, I'd just like to lastly reflect on my definition again, um, and that's something that I, I believe in, which is that inclusion is an environment that allows any individual to bring their whole self into the conversation, achieving uninhibited, equal contribution from all members of society. So, thanks very much. John, before you go down, mate, I might just uh, present you with a small token of our appreciation. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, John Van Broxby. So a couple of really um, pivotal and, and powerful points there that John makes for me in particular, um, having done some work in regional and remote WA over the past five or six years, it's an area that often gets overlooked. So the work you're doing in, in regional WA in particular is, uh, is really powerful and is continuing um, some really good start, sorry, continuing the great start that you made a number of years ago. So it's excellent to see that. Um, I love the asset-based approach as well. Um, so really working with local people as opposed to doing things to and for community, really working with them to find out what their needs are and working with the, and around those as well. I love the fact that it's young, old and everyone in between. Um, the move to social membership and, and social um, participation is also a really p um, pivotal one as well. Ladies and gentlemen, really urge you guys to check out Fair Game on um, social media and, and also on the website as well. Introducing our second guest, Erica Everett. Erica was raised in Vancouver, Canada and studied social work at the University of the Fraser Valley. She graduated in 2008 and during her studies worked in the disability sector as a caseworker. Erica volunteered for her local council's diversity services team in a pilot project which incorporated children with disability in mainstream summer camps. The aim of this program was to end the segregated model of how councils ran summer camps and other activities. The pilot was so successful that it still runs today. Upon graduating in 2008, Erica began her work in the homeless services and this is where much of her studies were focused. She continued this work when she relocated to Perth in 2009. Although Erica worked in homeless services, Erica had a passion for inclusion and in 2011, she made a career change into community development. In 2014, Erica joined the team at the city of Joondalup as Access and Inclusion Officer, where she continued to grow her skills, knowledge and tenacity around building and fostering accessible and inclusive communities. In 2018, Erica completed a qualification in Access Consulting and she looks forward to continuing and furthering her work in Access and Inclusion. When asked why social inclusion matters, Erica's response was, we all have a need and a right to belong and be valued for who we are. When we achieve a truly socially inclusive community, belonging and being valued happen organically and without effort. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Erica Everett. Can everyone hear, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, I might actually do that, that might be a bit easier. Great, so um, as you guys all probably know, inclusion solutions have nine pillars of inclusion. Today I'm gonna to focus on two of them. I'm gonna focus on policy and access. Um, the reason I've picked these is, that, is because they seem like the easy choice for local government. And that's because as a local government or as any local government or public authority in the room, we all have a requirement to have a disability access and inclusion plan, which covers your access and your policy. 
But I want to talk about how the city of Joondalup has reframed the way we think about our requirements. So we include social inclusion in the mindset of our organization. And we're not just meeting our legislative requirement, we're going above and beyond. So the city of Joondalup started this shift with internal education. Um, we started talking about how access and inclusion is more than just disability access. We branded a message of accessible and inclusive communities for everyone, and we've carried and promoted that message since 2012 through all of our external um, messages on our access and inclusion plan, as well as internally. Uh, we, carry, uh, we have done different campaigns on it, and it's a consistent theme of branding to help people understand that when we talk about access and inclusion, we're talking about more than just disability access. So when we talk about access and inclusion, who are we talking about? We're talking about people with disability. We're talking about parents with prams and young children, seniors and older people, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, mental health conditions, just to name a few. So we're reframing who we're talking about to get a greater organizational buy-in. Um, we do this because more people in the organization can relate to the people that we're talking about. Most people have a grandparent or an elderly parent. You know, we all have, a lot of us have young children or friends with young children. It's easier for people to understand and to, to have that um, buy-in. So are we there yet as the city of June Lab? The city have staff that have great, a great organizational understanding of our obligations under the Access and Inclusion Plan. They understand the related policies. They have a shared responsibility of implementing and reporting on our plan. They have a keen interest in accessibility-based projects, and that's not just the community development team. I find consistently across the organization, I have people that are coming to me with ideas or have a lot of questions and have a, a real genuine interest in improving access and inclusion in the community. We also have a lot of um, training opportunities and education opportunities for staff. So I'd like to take this time to go into a, um, a more, more detail about the pillars of access and policy. So the first pillar I'll talk about is policy, and it includes the, value, um, the principles of values, contribution, and responsibility. So the city of June Delup's values are to be transparent, accountable, honest, ethical, respectful, sustainable, and professional. This is in all the work that we do, not just our access and inclusion plan but it does um, relate very naturally to the work that commu our community development team does, in, especially in access and inclusion. So all of these values align with our access and inclusion plan and our access and equity policy, as well as any other related corporate documents that are not always super, a super exciting read. Um, and it relates to how the city implements their access and inclusion plan. We really do try and go beyond the legislative requirements. There are seven domains that we are required to, to meet, um, but we, we really try to make sure that our action items are genuine and actually make a difference in the community. Um, so we remain true to our corporate values through our implementation and reporting processes, um, and we try to make, remain transparent. And we do this by I, an internal document. We have an implementation plan that's attached to our access and inclusion plan. It's been prepared to provide a clear breakdown of measurable actions and areas of responsibility, as well as a time frame in which those actions need to be completed by. It gets approved at an executive le level, so we have um, buy-in from the decision makers of the organization. They're giving their stamp of approval for these action items. We meet with um, everyone, team leaders, coordinators, managers, to discuss the, the plan as it's being made, to make sure they're comfortable with those actions and it's something that their teams can implement. And the access and inclusion officer works very closely with all of the other business units to ensure that their items are achievable. We have quarterly check-ins to make sure that things are progressing the way that they should. Um, I'm available to assist people if, if they're not achieving their actions the way that they should be or in the time frame that they should be. Um, managers also provide me an annual report on all, all of their actions, uh, actions which we lodge with dis um, disability services at the end of the year. So even if we've agreed to actions and they haven't been completed or they've been completed and they're not successful, we also report on those and we give an explanation as to why it didn't work and how we can improve um, moving forward and that's part of that transparency for us. 
So it's through the process of joint planning, implementation, and reporting that we carry out our responsibilities of access and inclusion in line with our corporate values. So contribution is the second part of um, the policy pillar. Um, so how do we get the greatest contribution from our organization? City of Joondalup has many business units and over 600 staff, and we work in everything from outdoor areas to community development and everything in between. So the way that I find I get the greatest contribution is that I build relationships. I build them within and with, um, inside and outside of the organization. I make note of feedback, whether it's formal or informal, whether it comes from a community member, a service provider, somebody within our organization. I, I try and remember those passing comments. Somebody may not have given formal feedback, but they make a comment that I think, oh, that, that might be hit, worth hanging on to. I keep in touch with community members that I meet along the way. We get a lot of people coming to us um, asking for small requests. Can you lower a pram wrap in my neighborhood or can you cut a curb so I can get around? I keep in touch with those people. So when it comes time to designing projects or doing consultation for access and inclusion, I can get in touch with them and say, do you want to contribute to this? Um, more often than not, valuable contributions are made through conversations and relationships. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Remember that no contribution is too small. Some suggestions people make may seem in insignificant to you, but they could make a very big difference in, in the life of somebody who has barriers to inclusion. You need to notice your champions. Take note of people who um, may ask a lot of questions about access and inclusion, who may make a lot of comments or suggestions. Often it's those people that um, if you feel their interest and their passion, they will be your champions in projects that you need to get off the ground. So responsibility is the next, oops, sorry, is the next um, pillar, or the next principle of the pillar. So all city staff are responsible for the access and inclusion plan. It is the community development team that takes the lead on writing and reporting, but we have action items that go across all business units. And as mentioned before, we have a lot of meetings with um, managers and at the executive level to make sure that they are willing to take responsibility for the things that we're asking them to do. Um, some other things that we do to, um, we ensure that the action items in our access and inclusion plan are integrated into our business plans and our budgets for the relevant business unit, so we know we'll have the means to carry them out. Um, and we do things, we do new staff inductions for every new staff. They have to undergo an access and inclusion induction within their first three months. It, um, so they understand the responsibilities we have under our access and inclusion plan. And more importantly, they understand that message of accessible and inclusive communities for everyone, that it's not just disability access. We also provide two sessions of disability awareness training. Um, for staff, uh, we target it to different business units, so it's specific to the work that they do. We might um, do one for our events team on accessible events, or do one for outdoor workforce if you're setting up a, um, a work site and coordinating off sidewalks. How do you do that in a way that's not going to inconvenience people? Um, so this training is, is really thorough. It's a one-day course. It's the impact of disability on a person's life awareness of positive contributions of people with disability, how to design accessible and inclusive communities, and it also talks a lot about your invisible disabilities or other barriers to participation. So it talks about dementia, mental health, people from cold backgrounds, people who are experiencing homelessness. So it really promotes that message of we're trying to include everybody, not just people with disability. Um, we found that this training goes a really long way in gaining staff support to implementing our access and inclusion plan. Um, the way the training is delivered, it's by an external organization. People seem to gain a really genuine interest in access and inclusion after taking this training, which those people then become your champions. So next I'm going to talk about the, the pillar of access, which includes functional, physical, and social access. Um, I'm going to do it a little bit differently and talk about two stories. They're two recently completed projects that, uh, that the city has done. They were not access and inclusion based stories and uh, projects and they were not driven by the community development team. They were actually done by other teams and happened very organically because of that message of accessible and inclusive communities and that philosophy within the city of June Lot that carries through. So we recently, we redevelop a lot of buildings. We recently rebuilt the club rooms at Pennystone Park in Greenwood. Um, 
I sit on our project teams to provide generalized access advice, but that's more around, no, that toilet is too stall small or that ramp is not compliant. This one um, was, was really interesting because they went well above and beyond what our regular requirements would be and they really fostered a physical and functional space for people of all abilities. The um, club rooms have your standard accessible toilets, but they also have a adult changing room that's comparable to changing places. It has a, a lift, a hoist, the toilet. It's not accredited though, so it's not a changing places. Um, but it is, it is comparable, and that wasn't my idea. That actually came from one of the directors that was on that project team, and he thought if we had something like that, people have more opportunity to participate, whether it be watching sport or participating in the club, but there's a, a play group that also leases that space. All of the outdoor areas are fully accessible, so we've got an, it's hard to see in that photo, but you've got an accessible barbecue that has, um, has an angled underneath, so you've got leg clearance for people that are seated, and the picnic bench has a half seat on one side so people um, can sit there as well if they're using a walker or a wheelchair, if they have a guide dog, something along those lines. All of the, I really need like an aerial photo of it, all of the footpath path connections from the building throughout the park and to the sporting fields are connected and completely accessible. Has a nature playground with accessible equipment as well. So really um, anyone of any ability would have the full opportunity to play on the playground, use the um, barbecue and picnic space, watch sports, participate in the play group that's attached, um, or be a part of that club in, in whatever manner they wanted to be. So it's a really, a really fantastic facility and I was just so impressed that all of that happened without my advice or me saying you guys should really be thinking about this or that. It just happened and it's a really impressive facility. Um, social access. So we, our arts and culture team runs a program called the um, Community Art Exhibition. It's where um, local or amateur artists in different categories are, are invited to submit their artwork to the city. It's publicly displayed and they, ha they have an opportunity to sell their art and then there's awards at the end of it. Um, the gentleman that won the student category is named Chris. He dropped his work off at the city and he said, I'm Chris, this is my artwork, I have special needs. And that's all of the information he gave us. I wasn't aware of this until he actually won the student art category. He didn't win because we were doing him any favors because he has a disability. He won because he was the best in that category and his art was really quite impressive. So um, once he won, the lady running the project came to me and said, look, we have somebody with a disability that's won. We're not sure of the nature of his disability and we wanna make sure he's gonna be comfortable at the award ceremony and he's gonna be able to participate with all of the other winners. How do we do that? I found it excellent that they were able to come to me and say, look, we, we want to do this. How do we make it work for this individual? I give them a little bit of, of advice. They spoke to Chris's parents. Um, and respectfully asked about his disability and what will work for him at this function. How, how can we make this work for him? We had to um, alter very little to the way that we do things because it was already be, being run in a way that was accessible and inclusive. So there was very little we had to do for Chris to make, to make this a good experience for him, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, during Chris's acceptance speech of his award, he did announce to the crowd that he had um, special needs, his words, and I actually think that was really great because it brought an awareness to the rest of the community of the contributions of somebody with disability and that they are just as valued and just as talented as the, as the rest of the artists that were competing in this field. So that was a just, I think, a, ve a very, very good outcome. Um, Chris's mom then wrote into the city after the after the event to thank us and I'd just like to read what she wrote because it really highlights that we didn't have to do anything th special or really go to the way because of the way we already run our events and programs. So this is from Chris's mom. This is just to say thank you so much to everyone at the city of Joondalup for such a lovely evening. Thank you to your care in ensuring Chris would be okay receiving his award and he wouldn't be overwhelmed. This event helped Chris in so many ways, most of all inclusion in the community and we will remember this for a long, long time. So this feedback to our team was very important. It, it really highlighted that we are, we're getting it right. We still have a long way to go as do most other local governments, but I think we are on a good path of creating that accessible and inclusive community. So in closing, when I was writing my notes for this, I was asked to focus on only two of the nine pillars and I found it really difficult to, to stay on topic. 
But then I realized it's because when you have good policy and good practice and good knowledge of why access and inclusion is important, the other things fall into place. Um, the other philosophies of all the other pillars happen organically, and, and the two stories I shared are just examples of, of how those things happen more organically. Um, so I'd, I would just like to reiterate, as the access and inclusion officer, I didn't, I didn't spearhead those projects, and I didn't push those projects. They just happened, which is always something I want to see in my role. And that concludes. Any questions? No? Thank you. I'd like to thank Erica for the wonderful presentation and a little bottle of wine for thank you for tonight. So thank you very much, <laughs> Erica. So. Thank you. <laughs> All right, really, um, I just undone that, I think. Um, really important couple of messages there. Um, firstly, I guess utilising the disability access and inclusion plan across all elements of the business. Um, we work with a lot of uh, local governments, as Kira alluded to earlier, um, and the City of Joondalup have really set a benchmark in recent years, and, and Erica, no doubt a lot of that has come down to your work as well, so well done on that. I love the stories um, of Chris and also Penny Stone Park. Having been an ex-resident um, ex of, of Greenwood, I did notice that massive improvement there, so well done on that. And um, ladies and gentlemen, now we're moving to our morning tea, which is provided uh, by Fresh Convenience. We've got 10 to 15 minutes. Um, you'll hear a bell at the back end of that morning team. We'll try and usher you back in here because we've got two wonderful speakers to um, uh, continue on in the, set, in the back half of this presentation. So enjoy the morning tea, strike up a few conversations, and we'll see you in about 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you very much, and I trust you enjoyed a cup of coffee and some yummy treats. I'd like to introduce our next, uh, our next guest, Christy McNamara. Christy has worked in the disability sector for over 16 years. Commencing in the sector in her 20s, Christy recognised that people with, living with a disability were treated significantly differently to those that didn't have a disability. She realised that people with disabilities were being denied the right to everyday life experiences. Determined that her work would be part of the solution to changing attitudes instead of being part of the problem, Christy moved from government to a not-for-profit where she began work for Recreation and Sport Network, now known as, now known as Inclusion WA. Working for the past 10 years with Inclusion WA, Christy has had the opportunity to gather knowledge from thought leaders of our time to shape individualised services that support people to have real choice and control over their lives and to ensure that people have access to everyday life experiences. When asked why social inclusion matters, Christy responded, social inclusion matters because it's not a privilege but a right for all human beings regardless of our differences. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Christy McNamara. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Um, I will. Can you hear me? So today is about having a conversation um, with you guys who are in the room today um, because I feel it's really important that we who live in the community and who work with people who are devalued, um, it's our role to help facilitate people to gain valid roles in their community. Um, a lot of people's uh, weeks are actually filled with activities rather than looking for valid roles. So as a, as a I want to give you some background to um, Recreation Network and the prior to it being coming Inclusion WA. Um, ten years ago, we worked with um, a number of different people to help us, I guess, change the way we were working. Um, we did a lot of participation, so a lot of people were seen to be in the community, but not really connected to people in the community. Um, so these are the people that I would say helped shaped how we work today in 2018. Um, Heather Simmons, she helped us by holding a mirror up to our service and said, are you guys really supporting people to be involved in the community, having valid roles, or is it about participation? Ross Bowden, he was our evaluator back many years ago in 2008. He said, feedback's great. You guys are lovely people. 
but you take people out for coffee and cake all the time. And we were like, oh, yeah, right. We thought that was inclusion back then. So 10 years ago, going out, doing everyday activities, we thought that was inclusion. Um, and he really helped shape saying, it's not just about being out there, but it's actually about getting people involved. Mr. Armstrong, um, SRV training. So it underpins the work we do, helping us understand that people have wounds, people who are devalued, they need to have valid roles to actually be valued in their community. Wolf Wolfensberger and Joan O'Brien are two people that underpin not only our work, but the work of the three other people. So these are the questions that we asked, and I really want you to take time to actually look at these questions and walk away from today and actually reflect on them. Do you really want the people you support to experience the good things in life? So we sit in this room and we actually have good things in our life. Yeah? Would you agree with that? Do you think the people from marginalised backgrounds have the good things in life? So it's really important to reflect on those questions. Are you prepared to do what it takes to make that happen? So whether that be a service provider, local government or a community member. It's really important to reflect on those questions. So what does it mean to actually plan for roles and not just activities? So planning for roles and not activities is shifting the focus away from just filling people's time. Whether that be a community group offering programs that's only for people with disabilities through to organisations actually thinking about how we use people's activities to find valued roles and to search for the person's ticket out of isolation, find the one special attribute that could help facilitate a meaningful connection with the person's daily activities. So roles are both positive and negative. Positive roles are things like being a volunteer, a homeowner, a student. They're things that society value as a whole. Negative roles are things like people being a doll bludger, homeless person, a teenage delinquent. These are roles that society doesn't value and it further devalues people in their society. So roles exist regardless if you have a disability or mental health from a marginalised background. They exist in everyday life domains. So that's household, relationships, community, citizenship, leisure, interest, culture, education and work. And as you can see, there are both positive examples and negative examples. And we have to be really aware of these things when we're working with people or interacting with people in the community. So to support people to have valid roles, you must have to have high expectations of the people we know or work alongside. We have to believe that people can grow and develop. We have to look for opportunities and possibilities rather than barriers. We have to be con conscious that we make assumptions about people. And we need to recognise this work requires being artful and being creative. This is not easy work. And we need to practise positive persistence. Hands up if you're a service provider. Yep. So we know it's hard, right? Work with people and their life is full of complex and you know, serious situations, but we have to be persistent. We have to make sure people, we're being positive and we're practising that persistence for people. So I'm going to share you a story about planning for roles in action using a story about Brooke. So this is Brooke. She's, I love this photo, I love ours. Um, Brooke, Brooke had lots of daily activities happening in her life. So when we started working with her, it was about cooking activities education activities like studying for her learners, animal companion course. It was about helping her learn transport routes. It was about helping her discover um, things to do like volunteer roles. So they were very separate. They were very separate sessions um, that we're working with her on. So then with planning for roles, it's about what is Brooke's history? What are her interests? What are the possible valued roles that could come from actually focusing on these particular activities. 
What is the most important role which should we begin, which will have the most profound effect? And what is involved for Brooke to successfully do these roles? So the power of 10 is a really, really powerful tool. It helps us use our brain and push our thinking process around actually thinking about this thing a lot deeper. So it's a brainstorming tool and anyone can do this in this room. We don't have time to do the activity today, but I can hook you up. So with Brooke, we used her interest of animals and we did a power of 10. So we went through all the things that you could do with animals, like so from the basic to like visit a zoo, walk the neighbour's dog, own a pet, etc. But remembering it's about what's the most powerful role that she could hold. So she chose to do volunteering with animals. So this is how we work. There's a lot of stuff on there, so you don't have to read it all. But it's about breaking down about what Brooke needs to do and what our support, regardless of your community group, an individual, a service provider, about what Brooke might do and what the person might do who's supporting her. So it's about understanding if Brooke wants to do this, then what is our support to that? So when it comes to actually like supporting people to do their valid role, they need to make sure that it's done in the right setting. So you wouldn't volunteer with animals at Kmart. You know, it's actually about connecting a person to do the right role in the right setting. It's about the language that we're using. It's about the grouping. So who is Brooke participating with? Is it other volunteers? Would it be volunteers in, I don't know, the paper shredding factory? No, it wouldn't. It would actually be about Brooke grouping herself with people from the actual volunteer role at the shelter the activities that she undertakes and the personal appearance. So what does Brooke wear? Is she going to go in a ball gown? No, she's not. She's going to go in what other volunteers are wearing. So it's our, it's our role to make sure people are supported to look the part, act the part and be the part. So Brooke was supported to maintain and strengthen existing roles. So Brooke was doing a lot of things like the cooking. She was doing you know, learning about the animal companions. She was learning how to get there. So it's our role to make sure we understand that people can develop and strengthen their existing roles. It's important that people preserve and strengthen existing roles that are important. And jumping from activity to activity in order to seek new roles can lead to a loss of existing roles. So it's really important that we just didn't jump around from one volunteer role to another volunteer role. It had to be done consistently within that one place. So John O'Brien, he has the vital dimensions of inclusion, as you saw before. This is how, as a community group, a local government or an individual, this is how we actually monitor if we're actually doing the right thing. So the work we do with Brooke, are we helping her share in ordinary places? Is our support working against that or are we working towards it? Making choices. So is Brooke actually participating in the fact that she wants to work at that particular volunteer? Is the work that we're doing, is it getting in the way or is it working towards supporting her? Again, developing her abilities. Respect and valued roles was highly important here. Again, Brooke was really well connected to her family and her staff, but it was about how we get Brooke connected to the people in the actual volunteer role and growing in relationships as well. So again, it's about the work we do, is it working towards or against? So Brooke's story ended. So Brooke, like I said, she was doing lots of cooking. So how Brooke actually got to know a lot of people really well was she used to bake some really yummy Muffins. Is that right, Ramona? Yep. Um, and so bringing, that's a valid role. If you bring food, bring morning tea, and you're actually facilitating people to be having a gathering around food, it's, it actually sends a positive message to say, this person is like anyone else in this particular role. Um, Brooke developed her skills to get to the, um, to get to the shelter independently. Um, she, used, she used public transport and Ubers. Um, she used her baking skills. Um, she developed her skills that she required to not have us in her life anymore. 
So we do not support her to attend this session anymore because we facilitated the connections actually in that group. Um, and Brooke is using her TAFE course to further her progress actually at the um, shelter. So it's connecting all those activities that she's doing to actually have a valid role. So some last thoughts. Planning for valid roles and not just filling people's time with activities are vital for people to experience the good things in life. The good things in life do not exist within services. So it doesn't exist in our service, it exists actually in the community. Our role in the lives of people who are devalued in community is to support them to preserve, maintain and strengthen existing roles and avoid entry into negative roles and gain new valid roles. Thank you. Now, Christy, I know how much you like a good drop of red, so oh, thank you very much. I needed this beforehand. Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. There you go. Thank you very much from our team to yours. Appreciate it. Put your hands together once more for Christy McNamara. <laughs> Christy, some really powerful messages there, and really the key that I take away from that is very simple. It's person-centred, and it's about making meaningful change in the lives of individuals organisations, systems, schools um, and so forth with good intent can do damage and it's really important to recognise that with some, mean with some meaningful thought and um, consideration a lot of good can be done. So I know you've done a great deal of work over 10 years and continue that. So thank you. All right, I might just get a little bit of help if that's all right, just for a sec, just to grab a couple of seats. Go a little bit more casual for this one. And I'd like to introduce my next special guest, James West. Welcome, mate. To you. Grab a seat. So, James West was born and raised in Christchurch, New Zealand. He spent over 25 years of his career working as a youth mentor. And in 2011, James and his family relocated to the sunny slopes of Northam, a country town in WA's Wheatbelt region. <laughs> Following their arrival, James set about doing what he does best, and that is getting to know as many people and community members of the local community. James has a particular interest in people, their welfare, and the provision of opportunity. It was at a community forum merely weeks after arriving in town that James was nominated by 10 others to manage Northam's then underutilised PCYC. Knowing little about what he had said yes to, he rolled his sleeves up and got about to work. Within days, James was able to identify and understand what was important to the local community. Within weeks, he'd set up a myriad of programs and opportunities, and once again, all using local community members and local resources. Within a month, the Northern PCYC was once again a flourish of activity. James describes his approach as unconventional and results focused. Over the past seven years, James has played a major role in unifying the Northern community and has now set about the challenge of working in the big smoke. His approach as a genuine community builder and, and the outcomes that James has, has achieved have seen him recognised for numerous prestigious awards over the past few years. When we asked James why social inclusion matters, James responded with, by finding out what is important to people, we can change perspectives and break down barriers. Social inclusion is about understanding each other's circumstances, giving people options and creating change. Once again, please welcome James West. Thank you. So James, to start us off, tell us a bit more about who the real James West is. Uh, you've pretty much described it, so thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no. stay on. First of all, uh, look, I would like to acknowledge the uh, Noongar people, um, the traditional owners. Um, I also want to acknowledge our, the three speakers as well, you know, John, Erica, and Chris. I want to acknowledge you guys for coming up and speaking. Um, I don't like being on stage. I, I, I'd rather be walking on the, on, the, on the carpet here because... Um, you know, I don't see myself up here as an esteemed person because I'm the person that 
when I arrived here, I sat at the back and, um, you know, one of the ladies said, you need to sit in the front. I went, no, because I don't want to be in the front. You know, it's all about what I do in the community. So um, a little bit about myself, uh, as you can um, listen to my accent, I, I, I am a New Zealand. I'm a proud Māori person. Uh, moved here in 2011 from New Zealand. Uh, you know, for me to move over here, I always talk about my, my family. My uh, wife is a civil engineer. Um, she's a regional manager for main roads in Northam. That was the reason why we moved to Northam, um, from three degrees to 45 degrees. I, I cried when I got to Northam because I felt like I was in an oven. Um, my wife said to me, we were going to go to Bernard Park and have some lunch. Uh, I took out my sandwich, it started to melt. So my cheese was all over my hand and I started crying again. I said, take me back to the airport. I want to fly back to New Zealand. Um, and we've got three beautiful boys. My oldest is 18. He's at Curtin University studying mechanical engineering. So that's mummy's boy because uh, she's an engineer. I have a 16-year-old uh, boy who's travelled the world uh, playing a trumpet, got to go to Gallipoli, um, and he got to see a lot of uh, Germany, uh, France, England, and I have a 13-year-old who is my oldest because my 13-year-old thinks he's the oldest. Um, he, uh, he, he's not planning on doing anything because he wants to stay home and mum and dad are going to look after him. <laughs> so he's, he's happy. He's happy being, uh, being the youngest. Uh, unfortunately, he gets all the hand-me-downs. So whatever passed to my oldest went to my next boy and obviously passed on to him. Unfortunately, my middle boy, Deshaun, he's six foot three. Um, just under 100 kilos, I thought, yes, I've got an all black in the making. I thought, wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy this, and, uh, and, he, and he said he wants to play soccer. So, so when he went on the soccer field, they put him in Goldie. So I, w I was like, well, how come you're not out? And he goes, well, because I can protect the whole gold. So he's <laughs> six foot three. So, so that, that's, you know, for me, it's all about my family, and, and uh you know, I, I was privileged in New Zealand that I worked with gang kids. So I started an alternative education where they go to school in the morning and in the afternoon we were able to go out and do things in the uh, community. And, and we didn't have any red tape. So, you know, we could go hunting, we could go fishing, we could go um, into, into the bush. Uh, you know, and unfortunately over here there's so many red tapes that you want to take young ones out to the bush, you know, you've got to fill out this form, you know, if they're part of DCP, if they, the school is, and, and, and it's frustrating because we want to take them out to the bush, the ones over here, and we didn't have that, that issue in New Zealand. So moving to Northam, um, I didn't have to work because my wife's working, so I thought I'd just stay home and watch Foxtel. And, and just do nothing. And, I, and my wife said, you better go and do something. So I, I decided I wanted to learn more about the Aboriginal culture. So I wanted to learn about the Noongar people and how they um, worked in, uh, in the community. And I thought, man, what if they're like the New Zealand, you know, the Māori people back home? And, and they're not. They're completely different. They are completely different. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is different. But... I wanted to learn and I, I challenged myself to learn more about the Noongar people and, um, and how we got in, you know, how, how they work and, and that's how I got involved with the community. So, uh, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. That photo up there, that's me, just relaxing and, and chilling with the kids. That was actually a holiday program and uh, that photo actually, um, I ended up getting uh, for a finalist for the Constable Key Award. That was the photo. Um, Inclusive WA rang me and said, look, we're putting out a, a, a booklet and can we use that one of the photos? There's a photo of uh, myself doing a kite um, holiday program, you know. So that's what I love to see is those sort of things. So, yeah, sorry, but took no, longer than carry normal. Carry on. <laughs> James, you've got a, a really strong reputation um, in the community of always finding a way. Um, how important is it for you to include people based on how they would like to be included? Yeah, look, there's, um, you know, we, we, we actually just practised this about, it, you know, last night actually. You rang me and said, are you ready for your questions? I said, no, not really. Because I, um, look, you know, you know, it's really important for me, you know, just, um, you know, working with the community, understanding, you know, we want to work with older ones, young ones, people with disabilities, different cultures. One of the biggest things that I, I work with within the cl and inclusive in, in Northam uh, and now working here in the city is 
um, is working with all. You know, I, I talk to youth. I, I, I've never talked in front of adults before, and it's quite daunting because you're all looking at me thinking, what's he going to say? <laughs> Whereas the little ones, they are either doing something else. Some of, them are, some of them are calling out, you know, and I said to those four over in the corner, don't shout out anything because you could hear what I was saying. So, you know, this is for me is learning about how to deal with young ones, old culture, uh, people with disabilities, people that don't have this, you know, just, it's all about working all together, I suppose, as, as we're just being choiceful, what we do, yeah. Now, how do you go about engaging a diverse group of people? We've got many community development practitioners in the room, and many of us, no doubt, at some stage in our working careers have um, really encountered difficulties engaging a group or a, an individual. How does James West go about that? Look, for me, is when I, when I walk into a room or like in this situation here is, you know, I've got to read the environment. I've got to see how everybody's acting. You know, the good thing about it is you're all looking up here. None of you are on your phone, you know, because you tend to go to these sort of conference and, you know, you're busy playing on your phone or you're talking to someone. So I, I look at that sort of situation. But also is, you know, not to be afraid, you know, to go up and, 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 and talk, you know, start that first conversation, start talking to, you know, um, it, it's, it's hard when you, you, you know, come to a whole group of people and, you know, I'll, I'll take an example when we were going to get something to eat, we, uh, Esther and I um, from Kensington PCYC, you know, we weren't quite sure, could we go out and talk to someone, how do we go about doing it? And I was amazed, people were coming to us and, you know, saying, hi, hi you know, my name is, and, and that. So a lot of it is, is to, to get the environment, to try and find the best way that suits you as a person to be able to, um, to get the involvement going. Now, I noticed a couple of years ago, James, um, when you were running sessions through the break, and I'm throwing this out, it's not in your notes, don't, don't bother. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that you did, um, I guess, as well as anyone, if not better than anyone else that I ever know, um, that I've ever seen, is that you really engage with youth and, and kids during the, the breaks. Um, is that for any specific reason, or is that something that you've always done? Is that a conscious effort that you make? Yeah, I, th I think it's it's. I always do it. You know, it, it doesn't matter where, what culture you are. You know, a lot of times we deal with a lot of at-risk youth. And, and a lot of them are just looking for that role model, just looking for someone to talk to, someone to, um, to share their stories, and, and that's where we come in. And, um, you know, I, I spoke to you, you guys about my, my family and my boys, my three boys, and, um, you know, trying to be a, a best father as I can. What we tend to find out is we, we become fathers for other, other youth. We become fathers for, you know, other parents as well. And, um, you know, we strive, and well, I strive for that there, is to be as successful as I can. And for me, it's about, you know, working with them and, and, and understanding them, how we understand them um, in a way that we feel comfortable. And they feel comfortable because we don't want to overstep the mark because there's a few times you talk to someone and, and they will tell you in their own words, later, you know, and so what, when it means that, you've, you, you've got to give them that space. Um, and then at the same time, you want to just let reassure them that, you know, hey, we're here to listen to whatever you need to do. So that's how I work it. Great. Now, you speak a lot about opportunity and the importance for kids and youth in particular to be granted some opportunities in communities, in particular communities like Northern, um, you know, that are traditionally a little bit more difficult or a bit different to deal with. Um, why is it important for individuals to be given opportunity in their lives? Um, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a quick story with you. We had a young girl uh, in Northam, and um, a lot of the st uh, young girls in Northam they tend to go through a bit of a a, a pattern. You know, uh, they they become pregnant at a young age. Uh, we had three young girls uh, pregnant at the age of 15, um, and this young girl was following the same pattern and. Um, and we spoke to her and said, you need to make a change. And uh, we spoke to her mum and dad. And and the one thing she wanted to become was a police officer, a young Aboriginal girl. And, and um, so she went off to police college. And um, she's now working up in the, in the Pilbara, um, got t uh, two beautiful boys. I actually rung her just before I come here and I, I spoke to her. And I said, uh, Katie, I said, I'm, I'm speaking at a forum. I don't know what to say. Uh, I'm freaking out because I don't know if these people are going to laugh or just sit there and tell me to get off the stage. But I want to tell them your story. And she said, please, please tell them a story. We went away on a camp. 
We had to ring her parents to come and get her. We were three hours away from Northam. They had to come and get her. They were angry. She was angry at them for coming. She was angry at us for telling them to come. And, and when I told her what I'm going to tell the story about, she said, yeah, please tell the story because we need to get the story out on positive things. I don't know how many of you guys have seen always in the news about Northam and there's always never getting any good news. There was an incident in regards, um, I think it was so much cocaine or, or, or methamphetamine was actually um, seized in Northam. Well, it wasn't actually Northam. It was just on the Great Eastern Highway. It was just next to Northam. But everybody was going, poor Northam. Now the drugs, it wasn't Northam. It was just that they got caught coming from New South Wales to WA and it just happened to be at Northam. So I wanted to share a good story about Northam and about this young girl who's a police officer who's now living up uh, up in the Pilbara and she's doing amazing things. Um, and so for me, is those are the things that I like to hear. You know, we love to change everybody, but you know, if we can change one person, that's that's a blessing in, in my eyes and that's a blessing in our community. If we can change everybody, I'll be out of a job. You will be out of a job too. Majority of you will be out of a job. So, <laughs> but I guess that's what we all work towards. Now, one of your um, I guess pet topics is communication. While communication is a massive subject, can you touch on your overall view of the importance of having strong communicational skills um, and, and how does this make or break communities from your experience? Um, I'm just trying to look at all that I wrote down actually and yeah, I didn't write anything down. <laughs> so I think it just comes down to the gift of the gap. So I'm just going to be honest with you. The communication comes down to being confident um, and speaking, in, not only like myself, speaking in front of all of you today, it's about being confident. And, and um, you know, it, it comes to practice. You know, uh, uh, when I was at school, I, I, I didn't like talking in front of uh, anybody at school. And, and the more I got used to talking in front of people, the more confident. When you get confidence, um, sometimes you can be overconfident. But, you know, you, you feel in yourself that you can communicate uh, with any person in, in um, not only in the community but with with people with uh, with disability because um, you know we take for granted simple things um, you know like a, a story when I, I was teaching at a school and we were working with uh, some young kids with disability and uh, you know just bouncing of a basketball the joy on their face and it was such a simple thing Yet you, you bounce a ball in front of guys that, or girls that play basketball and they think this is boring because they do it all the time. So it's just about that basic communication and just, um, for me, it's about enjoyment. You know, enjoy what you do, enjoy who you're in the company with to be able to understand how we communicate with everybody. I hope that answered that question. Great. Now let's change tact a little bit and present you with a situation. Um, let's imagine that you've been asked to work with a new community. Your role is to bring people together and build a stronger community. Where does James West start and what do you specific or how do you approach this situation? Look, this is a great question because I don't know the answer. I'm thinking of it. That's why I said great question. I think the main thing for me is what you need to do is you've got to go out to the community. You've got to go to the parks. You've got to go to the schools. Um, I've just started at Kingsington PCYC. Um, I'm the state boxing coordinator for WA PCYC, so my role was to get boxing up and running in all PCYCs. And being in Kensington, um, one of the things that I, I had to do was go to the schools around that area. I had to go to the parks. So it's about engaging with the community, engaging with the youth, um, and, and, and actually showcase, you know, when, when I showcase uh, boxing, um, I, I, I let them take control of the boxing situation and uh, you know because everybody everybody knows how to box everybody knows how to do certain things but I, I teach in a way that they feel honored and privileged to be able to do that and talking to the community as well talking to the mums and dads um, talking about how we as PCYC as a whole will keep everybody safe because a lot of parents um, you know, they want the best for their, their young ones, their children or, or the older ones that, they, that are in their house. They want the best for them, but they also want to make sure that they're safe. So we've got to create that safety for them. And, um, yeah, so, you know, whether it's putting on an event, whether it's, uh, you know, the best thing about uh, Northam, if you ever want to put on an event, just put some food on. 
because everybody comes for food, and uh, and the reason I've come to this is because of the food. So, <laughs> <coughs> you know, it's not about being paid. It's not about having all the money in the world. It's about the not only the the company but also the food. So, yeah, that's how I would do it. <laughs> It's actually a really good, um, really good piece of advice, and I think especially when dealing with youth and um, and, and children as well, um, and in communities such as Northern, it, it really worked well, and I witnessed that. Um, James, what are the biggest differences? And it's not on there either, mate. But what are the what are the biggest differences <laughs> between working in regional and, and the city? When when I first moved to Northern, and and I wanted to know a lot more about the Noongar people or the Baladon people out in Northern. Uh, one of the things that I had to do, first of all, is I actually went and, and sat with the elders and uh, and I spoke to them and uh, Pop Mark Davies, who's, who's passed away, the first thing he said to me is, are you a wadjala that's going to come to our town, hang out with our kids and in a year's time, I'm going to say it, piss off. And I said, first, what's wadjala? Because <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. And then when he said to me, are you going to be a white fella that comes into the town and then leaves. And I said, sorry, mate, I've just bought some land. I'm going to build a house. My, my wife has got a regional job. My, my kids are going to be going to school here, so I'm not going anywhere. He wouldn't trust me. It took six months, and I was at a footy match, and all these young kids jumped in our car because it was raining, and Pop Mark, and that pulled up next to me, and the first thing he, I said to him was, hey, any one of these kids your grandkids? He sort of looked at me and sort of, you know, he wasn't, and he just said, oh, I'll see. It took me a, a year or so before he said, you have got my blessing, whatever you do in the town, um, to do with our kids, you have got my blessing. So, And it's taken me five or six years to establish that in, in Northern, to be able to trust especially in the, in the elders. So if I ever did anything in the community, I would always go and see the elders, go and talk to them and say, look, this is what I want to do, whether it's hip-hop dancing or culture dance, um, part of NADOC. So I had to do that sort of thing to um, to be able to do that. So, um, you know, and I'm going to have to do the same in the city because the region is completely different in the city, you know. Um, but it's a patient thing. Unfortunately, all the, the jobs that we do, we have to be patient in what we do because uh, it just doesn't happen overnight or it just doesn't happen. we just got to work at it patiently. Same when I, when I started with Inclusive WA, when they first came out to Northam and they wanted to run the holiday program, you know, it took us it took us three or four years before we established it. And then when they left, we all cried because we didn't know how to organise anything. So we were sad that they left, but it was our time to take over. You know, so Inclusive moved out, we had to take over and we got to know the staff really well, we got to know Denver really well, we got to know everybody in the staff and that was because we built up that great relationship at the start and we progressed at it. And I think one of the key things there is sometimes communities need a helping hand. Um, from our point of view, I guess we always saw it as um, working with the community groups and local clubs um, and the really pleasing thing in Northern was several years after we removed ourselves from that situation, that community really flourished. So from our point of view, I guess it's, it's important to remember um, organisations, I guess, that we do just enough to help people um, do things for themselves. Mm -hmm. And James actually took, took a lead role in that. So he might talk that down at times, but he took a lead role in that community as a community leader um, to progress that. So time now to move on to the audience. Have, has anyone got any questions of James that you'd like to ask? Beautiful. I love that. Low <laughs> one, yeah. So I hope you're providing lunch. Nice and easy. <laughs> so, Deb, you've got a question. Just one sec, I'll get Kira to run this out with me. Uh, kia ora, James. Kia ora, kia ora. Uh, don't forget you had a treaty. Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> um, why boxing? Why boxing in PCYC? How, how did that evolve? Can you let me know? I, I think w in regards to boxing, the reason why we, we looked at boxing, um, 75 years ago when PCYC first started, it um, unfortunately was a boys group and why the, the dads and that were away at war, they uh, were getting them fit and boxing was part of the program that um, was introduced into PCYC and then um, obviously gymnastics took over because gymnastics is very big in PCYC at the moment and uh, last year um, they, they sat down with me and discussed about bringing boxing in and I think a lot of it's to do with um, just building up their self-esteem um, 
We want to start boxing in the morning, so they a bit of fitness, bit of boxing, give them something to eat, and then obviously move them on into schools or, or programs. And and because uh, boxing, we it's not just boxing. There's also uh, becoming a referee, becoming a judge, becoming a coach, becoming a corner person. Um, it's very big in Sydney, uh, in uh, especially in South South Sydney. They they have a lot of young Indigenous ones going through boxing. Um, and I think it's just trying to find a, a way for them to um, take out frustrations. And, th- and that's the reason why we looked at going down the boxing line. Mm, yeah. Thank you for that. Kia ora. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the wonderful James West. Thank you. James. Little token of our appreciation, mate. So thank you very much for your time today. No. Always a pleasure. Thanks, thank man. you. Thank you. All right, before I conclude this wonderful forum, I'd like to acknowledge our special guests once again, Matthew and Emma from Minister Mick Murray's office, MLA Janine Freeman, Kelly and Jane from the NDS, and I want to reiterate it's wonderful to work with the team at NDS and they're a key partner in bringing you this forum today. And Joshua as well from um, uh, the Honourable Simone McGurk's office as well. So in summary, today Kira took us through a number of frameworks, um, some really powerful tools that you can use in your work beyond here. So whether that be community life, whether that be at your local club or in work situations. John addressed fair game and some key messages from one of the top 10 youth leaders across the world, really important. Erica took us on a journey of um, at what uh, I guess inclusion is, and it's not just about access, and it relates to all parts of the business and can provide profitability across all parts of the business. So really important messages there from Erica. Christy discussed the, the need to plan for roles and plan for person-centred planning around the individual. And finally, James spoke a little bit about his background and his experiences in unifying that community of Northern. So, a couple of special thanks today. I'd like to acknowledge the team at Bendat Community Centre. If anyone's looking for a great community venue and they're absolutely brilliant to work with, I highly recommend the team at Bendat. Emma, our volunteer photographer. Emma, I've got a little gift for you as well. Thank you for giving up your time. So Emma did an absolutely fantastic job last time. And, um, and those photos will be made available. We'll share the link as well. Bernie, for videography, thank you, mate, to you and your team. Always great to, have, to work with you guys. And also to my team, and in particular on this forum, to Dimi, to st- uh, step in for Christy Jolly, who's sunning herself in, in the States at the moment. Really appreciate all your hard work. <laughs> I'd finally like to thank um, the board of Inclusion WA, Paul Flay, our CEO, and the rest of the team, Kira and Christy in her absence as well. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we're really keen to um, keep improving these forums and tailoring the content to make sure that you get a a quality product next time. So today you'll receive an electronic survey in your emails this afternoon. Um, And I just want to reiterate that we've got two more forums for the year. The first will be, or the third forum um, of the year will take place on the 3rd of October and that'll be on sport and recreation. And And the last forum for the year will be on the 12th of December and that'll be based around community. Keep an eye on your inbox as well because we'll be sending you a special offer. Um, For those of you that have come to either the first or second forum, you'll get an offer for that. And just a reminder that if you could please tag us in your social media posts, you can find us at Inclusion Solutions WA on Facebook and please use the hashtag Social Inclusion Matters. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. Please stick around, have a cup of coffee with us, um, have a chat, and thanks again. We'll see you in October.